it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind it either heard me or smelt me and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up and that that shocked me they don't make people that that big the way it moved uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. Hey, this is Dan from Cuba, New York, and you're listening to the best podcast in all the land, Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, we're going to be chatting with uh, Rick. And Rick is a 22-year military veteran. Uh, he served our country. Thank you so much for your service, Rick. And back in the mid-90s, he had an encounter at Fort Lewis. Uh, it's a pretty fascinating account. I'll let Rick go into it. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. And if you're a member, please update your app. Or if you haven't gotten the app yet, go to your app store and download it. Makes it a little bit easier than going to the website. Uh, Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Rick to the show. Uh, Rick, thanks for coming on. Thank you, Wes. Happy to be here. Yeah, man. And I really want to talk about what happened to you at Fort Lewis. Uh, before we get into that, I know there was a strange incident um, a few years prior to you entering the military. Uh, if you would take me back to that moment, kind of what were you guys doing and and what happened? Yeah, um, the church I was going to had this Boy Scout like organization called the Royal Rangers and you know we it was all camping and all this stuff and you know knowing how to tie knots and the like and you know one of the trips that we took was up to Northern California to Mount Shasta we were going to camp out at this place called Lake McLeod and the only reason I remember McLeod is because of the TV show from the 70s and back then when the snow runoff was stronger than what it is now you can actually take a canoe on the mcleod river down to the lake and there were three canoes there were three people in each canoe and we were just roaming having a good old time and the guys on our right you know just kept looking to the bank and one of them actually said i think something's following us you know nothing we just kept on and they just kept turning and then one of them, um, his name is Pedro. He's, I got in contact with him in 2010 when Facebook came around and I found him and I asked him, Hey, do you remember that day? And he goes, yeah, because younger brother who was behind him actually saw it. And I'll get to that point in a bit. I'm sorry. So they said it was getting closer and then they smelled it. They smelled whatever was there. And Again, Epi said some 
um, said something to the effect, oh, man, that smells. You know, I just yelled out, hey, stop farting. And I had just finished saying farting when this rock that was the size of a basketball came hurling right through the hedges and the bushes because we couldn't see anything beyond that. And it landed about 10 feet to the right of my canoe. And it came out with such force that, okay, you know, if a guy was going to throw this, he was going to have to heave it like a basketball and he'd be lucky to even get half the distance that this thing was, was launched at us from. And when it hit, it splashed us. Um, and it, you, you know, how when you're throwing rocks in, in, in a river or in a lake, you know, you hear the, the, the sound is different. This sounded like kabunk when it hit. It was loud. And that scared the commanders that were with us enough that they said, okay, row fast, row fast. And we just started rowing. And the part that we rode around, I Googled Earth it. Um, it doesn't look the same it did anymore, but it was almost a complete circle around this bend on this river. And whatever was following us couldn't continue because there were no more hedges or anything. But when we were rowing, Pedro's younger brother, who was behind him, actually looked and he said what he saw was a head that popped out and showed its teeth and then slowly just backed away and didn't say anything to us. It wasn't until I found him on Facebook that he said, um, yeah, you know, he saw it, you know, if he saw it and I'm like, what do you see? And he's like, he said it was a, a monster. And, and I asked him, by that time, because by this time, I still didn't know what it was. It wasn't until I started watching all these shows on Bigfoot where rock throwing was seemed to be a constant story with many of these people that I was able to put one and one together. And I realized this had to have been a, a Sasquatch. And when, when I talked to Pedro about it, he he was saying oh it was a demon it was a monster you know a demonic thing and i i beg to differ with him on that one you know when he asked me didn't you notice that you know he you know he wasn't saying nothing for the entire trip he was scared and i'm like i didn't notice anything because i was too excited to go fishing and and jump in the lake but yeah that's basically what had happened none of us saw it but him yeah, it's a fascinating account, man. You know, I'm a big, strong guy. I know you're a big, strong guy, Rick. And, uh, you know, you give me a boulder-sized rock and I'll give it a go, but um, I'm probably going to throw it like five feet. Um, if, when you guys were in your canoes or rafts there, how far away were you guys from the shoreline that this rock came, you know, to your best estimation? You know, I've played this in my thoughts a lot. Um because I know we were at least 25 feet to the embankment of the river. And whatever came out of there, I mean, these bushes and, and, and these hedges and all the trees that were there, they were thick. And whatever was behind it had to have been at least another 12 feet. Because anything other than that would have been probably, probably would have been visible or to some degree. And this thing, so it had to have gone about 40 feet. And there's just no way a man can do this. Yeah, what did you think it was, Rick? I mean, I know we're going back, you know, 29, almost 30 years ago, and this rock comes out, and the guy that saw it never spoke about it till many years later. But at the time, what, I mean, I... I can't imagine like Bigfoot's probably in your mind at that time. I mean, what did you think it was? So just a people messing with you or? Jokingly, I said it was Bigfoot, um, but I didn't know. I, I At that point, I was 13 years old. Um, I'm like, I can't rationalize, you know, was it a guy that was growing illegal pot trying to scare us away? I don't know, because I knew back in them days, there in the Mount Shasta area and up north in Humboldt, 
that was like the marijuana growing capital of California back in the 70s and 80s. But it never dawned on me, not until years later, that what it had to have been, and, and only really what it, it could have been, was a Sasquatch. Yeah, it's hard to say what else it could be. I mean, bears don't throw boulders, and, you know, boulder-sized rock, I'd be impressed if a man could throw it 15, 20 feet. He would definitely impress me, but, you know, over 40 feet, I just don't see that. Uh, it's a very cool account. I kind of want to fast forward to when you were in the military in 1996, um, and I've had a lot of soldiers on from Fort Lewis and things that have happened to them. Uh, but if you would take us back, kind of what were you doing and, and what happened out there at Fort Lewis? Back then, I was with headquarters battery first of the 505th uh, PIR under the 82nd Airborne. And we had been, you know, it was on the books. We already knew that we were going to be doing some joint exercises at Fort Lewis with some Rangers. Uh, at that time, I was part of the S-4, which is basically supply and logistics. Uh, you know, I'd get the ammo. I was in charge of going to the ammo holding area. And if we were going to the range, how many rounds were we going to need? I had to account for everything and bring it back uh, when I brought what was unused. And we had to collect all the brass. And so they weighed the brass. They had to make sure that the brass that was brought back in was plus or minus close to what was taken out. So we're in meetings that technically I didn't have to be there, but my sergeant in charge, the NCOIC, the S4, asked that I be there. So, uh, well, he didn't ask, he more or less just said I had to be there. Um, and during these meetings, the S3, who is in charge of operations, was talking about the Op 4. He basically looked at me and said, Sergeant Munoz, you're going to be the Op 4 team leader. And I'm like, oh, shoot, this is going to be fun again. Um, and in these meetings, they decided, okay, we're going to do things that are different. We're going to have more fun with this than, than before. And so I was kind of curious. And one of the meetings that we had, I mean, leading up to this, because this was three months worth of planning to get ready, was, okay, I'm going to get four guys you know from different sections and they're going to be my op four the op four is the opposition force the you know we're the ones that uh are the bad guys we go out there and uh we do the attacking and then you know after that there's an actor after action review where they discuss what the unit could have did differently what they did well what they didn't do well and the like so we were given all these scenarios where we were going to have suicide vest, you know, uh, uh, squads running in with what appeared like suicide vests, where we're going to be doing drive-bys. We're going to be doing all these crazy things that really we've never done before, which was pretty cool. But another thing that he told me was, because we're going to be stretched out so much in all these op four missions, hitting different units at different locations, that we were going to be allowed to camp out somewhere, anywhere that we chose in the Fort Lewis range area. And we only had to come back every three days or so just to top off with fuel, get our water, get our MREs, and get right back out there. After about a week I mean, of this exercise, I had the map. I knew the scenarios because everything was already pre-planned where the units were going to be what the scenario calls for us to do and we have to report once it's completed i'm looking at the area that we're going to be engaging and who the other unit is going to be afterwards and i'm looking at it and i'm like you know there's nowhere really for us to go to really camp out and just chill out before the mission so i decided to be about five miles away compared to the one mile that we normally were at because uh, there was going to be a cluster of units in that area. So I found us a hilltop um, that was 100 yards off of the road, and we went up the hill. We were able to take the Humvee all the way up there. It was an, enough space between the trees that we could just drive it on up there, which was pretty cool. 
I told the guys, let's bunk down because at three o'clock we got to get up and we got to hit this company at around five or six o'clock in between that time. Um, I had the first fire guard shift and I woke up the next guy and, and then all hell broke loose at the bottom of the hill. Um, there was live fire and the, we, we all had blanks. We were firing blanks. We had the blank adapters on, you know, attached to the end of M 16s. Everybody in the, that, was in our battalion also had them and this was live fire and you can tell the difference between live fire and blanks there is a a very distinct sound between them one sounds like a firecracker the other one sounds like an m80 there is a difference um the guy that was on fire guard and the and another soldier that was sleeping outside and i was sleeping outside two of them were inside that humvee sleeping in the bed of the humvee we, we, you know, we woke up right away with the fire um, and we knew what it was. And we're like the fire guard, the guy that was on, on the fire guard, he wanted to run down there right away. And I stopped him. I'm like, Oh hell no, you're not going down there. And then unless it was the roar, there was a loud roar followed by an even louder roar that we felt. I felt it. Uh, the other two guys felt it. Um, made my stomach um, kind of like shake inside of me. Um, we got our boots on and got our weapons, and all five of us, you know, just started, you know, down that hill. We had our night vision goggles and. We, we got down, it was about 300 yards, about 300, excuse me, 300 meters. And um, we saw these two bright lights and we kind of stopped and we were hiding behind the trees trying to get a look at what was going on. And then within, and we, we still couldn't see what was happening. We, we could just see the lights. But we can hear the talk and we can hear a guy on a radio. Then somebody yelled out, hey, there's somebody up on the hill. They all turned and all their headlamps were pointing in our direction. And one of them said, hey, come on down. We can see you. Get down here. And I'm like, how in the heck did they see us? And um, the thing about if they had night vision, because when they hit us with the lights, it hurts your eyes with night vision because those bright lights are affecting your eyesight uh, because of the, of the night vision goggles. Uh, we took them off and we came down and and there they were. Um, there were two Bigfoot, two Sasquatches on the ground and they were dead. Well, the male was obviously dead. The female was on her back. Um, she was, you know, really labored in her breathing. And she expired right in front of us. One of the men that were there identified himself as a captain. And he was trying to get our attention or, you know, trying to, you know, asking us who we were, why we were there. Nobody was supposed to be up in this area uh, for the simple fact that as op four, we weren't, we, we didn't call it in. We didn't tell our S3 where we were going to be staged at. They only knew that we were staging near the, the companies that we were going to um, attack, you know? Oh, because you guys went in five miles further than you guys were supposed to be. Yeah. We were farther than we normally would. And that's the only place I thought we can have decent cover because it was a, we were in the South area of uh, the Fort Lewis area. And it was just a, a, a very large clearing. Uh, I, I don't know how big it was, but we're talking many square miles of just, just a huge clearing. And um, I don't mind. I'm shaking. Just remembering this. Um, 
you know, the, the guy that identified himself as a captain basically slapped me across the face to get my attention away from what was right there in front of us. And he asked me again who we were and what we were doing. And I gave my name, gave my rank, told him the units and told him, you know, we're the op four because we weren't dressed in our normal BDUs. I told the guys to have fun. If you had tiger stripe, if you have, you know, different type of uh, clothes. I mean, I had one guy that was wearing Saudi Arabian, you know, with uh, head, the head, the head piece with the, you know, that black rope around their head. We were just having fun with this. Um, that's when I really got a good look at these guys. There were eight of them. And it was obvious to me and to all of us, these guys were Delta Force. You know, they 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 were wearing um, the hockey style helmets. Um, whatever night vision they were using was not your standard issue. Um, if memory serves, um, it was a, a larger, bulkier, three scopes on it. Nothing like what we, what we use because ours was a single monocular night vision. And they, the only way they could have seen us up in that hill without night vision had to have been flare. Yeah, the body heat, and <sighs> so a call was made. We were pulled away, and it was obvious what what we saw with the Sasquatch. They were a lot of the the bullet hits that they had were on the lower extremities, in the knees, there in the knees. That's where the female, because she was on her back, and her knees from her uh, middle thigh on down, they were shot up bad. She had some body hits, and they were both obviously hit, shot in the head. Um, when we when this Humvee arrived, there was a full bird colonel that came out, and he just chewed us out why we were there and i had to tell the whole situation all over again we were taken away in in a five-ton truck and if we made any attempt to look outside uh we were you know told to quickly turn around and not to look outside um but b right before we got on the humvee it was myself and two others the two others that were outside not in the humvee we got sick. We we started hacking and throwing up. Um, I, I felt like I had seasickness, and I didn't. And I couldn't make heads or tails of it. I don't know why. We we could smell the Sasquatch. They 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 did have you know what people commonly smell the the wet dog, but it wasn't as to me. It smelled like when I gave my German Shepherd a bath. It, that same smell it wasn't as strong. It wasn't as pungent, but you can still smell them. Um, and just as we were boarding, um, a black hawk came right over that location. And the, the Delta Force, they were prepping these Bigfoot to get hauled away. And, um, and I guess that's what they did. Um, we they put us on in this truck and we were on the we were driving for about an hour and a half to two hours. I had been to Fort Lewis twice before uh, to do various you know training exercises and the like. And this area that we were at, I had no clue where we were at. It was, and these buildings were a heck of a lot much more modern than anything. I have ever seen. They took our weapons away. They put all five of us in a room. A short time later, this colonel came in with another officer who was a major and a plain clothes wearing a suit and tie. And we were threatened. This, that's why I was hesitant about ever talking about this. We were threatened with UCMJ action, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. 
we were threatened that we would go, we were threatened that we would be sentenced to Leavenworth. We'd have to do hard time if we ever talked about this, if we ever exposed what we saw. And at this time, and I don't think it was more for the Bigfoot, Wes. I think after our conversation, it kind of also remembered, it wasn't until just recently, some years back, that the government, the military, finally admitted to Delta Force. Even though, you know, Mogadishu had already taken place in 92, and people knew that the Delta Force were there, but still the government, the military government was saying there is no such thing as Delta. So I'm thinking this was maybe that reason. I don't know, but God knows I was scared out of my mind. It literally scared the PFC, the private that we had, who was the 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 the, the youngest and the lowest in ranking from from all five of us. He pissed his pants because they really put the fear of God in us. So we were released. We were taken back to that hill. It was by this time, it was 11 o'clock, and we were ordered to go back to the uh, talk, which is the tactical operations center where the, the higher ups are all staged at. And when we got there, our battalion commander was, you know, shoot out what was left of our rear ends. And the S3 was saying, what the heck happened? Because you did not respond on the radios. You didn't do your mission. What happened? What happened? And I told him, sir, you got to talk to the commander. Uh, I'm not saying anything. Um, from then on, we were, we had to conduct all our operations from the talk. We had to stay at the talk, go do our op four and then come back. But that whole time we would do this. I mean, go, we'd still park a mile away and, you know, go to the area. But, but this time we were scared. I mean, we were scared. Like, what if something's right there in front of us? What if, what if it comes out to us? Oh, we got our blanks. I'm like, man, I don't know. Just We just run. We just run. Yeah, I've heard a lot of uh, whispers and rumors that this actually does go on on these bases. And, you know, I'm always looking for other answers. Like, why doesn't the military address this with the soldiers? Why Why is it such a big secret? Um, I've, I've heard of other situations like this, not only at Fort Lewis, but at other forts. Uh, can we back up a little bit? And for the audience, can you kind of describe what you saw? What did the creatures look like? Yeah, the male was black, dark hair. It wasn't fur. It was hair. It's, it's legs. The, the, the leg hair wasn't as long as as the arm hair the the hair was long and stringy kind of like what you see with an orangutan but it was black it 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 was laying feet first from where we were at you could barely see what was the head because the traps and the back muscles on this thing were enormous they were huge they when I hear people talk about the box figure, how the chest is boxed, it didn't look like that to me. It just looked like the world's strongest man on on steroids, but it it was huge. The 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 muscles were the back muscles, the the traps looked like you know when Schwarzenegger would pose, but much larger. Um, the, the feet, um, I I've seen, I was lucky enough to, when I was a kid to stand next to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And I remember looking at his feet and they were huge. I mean, of course I'm eight years old, but I've never seen shoes this big. <laughs> this, this male's feet was, were way bigger than what Kareem's feet were. The way it was laying down, it, the right leg was stretched out and it was on his belly and its left leg was up and out, you know, like. Um, yeah, did it kind of look like it collapsed there in that position? Yeah, like it collapsed, exactly. And it just, 
it was just laying there. One, its right arm was out. Its left arm was closer to its body. Um, the, the, the feet were, you know, like a, like a very light gray, the soles of the feet. It, it looked like they had a line or a crack or something that went from side to side. I, I don't know if that's what they call the mid tarsal. I never really made that, but I remember seeing that line and it was pronounced It, you know, it went from, from one side of the foot to the other side, not lengthwise. The female was a dark brown. Again, there was limited light still, but it was a, to me, it looked dark brown. She was just as built as the male. The male had to have been 10 feet. I still say 10 feet to this day, seeing it in my head. The female was somewhere in the, uh, in the seven foot area. And it was obvious she was a female, but I, I remember seeing her breasts. As she laid on her back, one breast went down the side and the other one went down the other side uh, uh, of her torso. Um, her eyes were open when she died, right? I mean, and we were there when she passed her last breath. You could see her teeth, her mouth was open. The, the the teeth were about the size of hominy corn, you know. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, you know. We use it in, in menudo and a lot in Mexican delicacies and dishes and such. And But the canines were slightly larger than what a human canine. You know, if you were to see, look at your teeth in the mirror, you can see that the that the tip of the canine stick out just a little further than your normal teeth. Same thing with this canines, but they were slightly larger, but not like, you know, like, like a dog's, you know, teeth would look like and such, but you, it, but the rest of her teeth were flat. Sure. Her face where she, where there was no blood, because again, these these creatures were shot in the head. Um, but her face was gray. It, it, it looked like leather. It looked like oh god, I don't know how to describe it. Um, just, just almost like a soft um a, a baseball a gray baseball glove that in the leather was you know kind of kind of um. You know, showing its years, you know, um, on the side of the face, I, it looked like, you know, the, what you call the crow's feet. Um, her brow was pretty pronounced, but not like any of the other Sasquatch drawings that I've seen of the males where the brow is very pronounced. From my vantage point, I could only see the left ear. Uh, and it was small and towards the back. It it wasn't sticking out like like you would with a chimpanzee. Um, and a an orangutan ear is close to what I saw. And the mouth was wide. That's another thing that stood out. The mouth was wide. It was wider than what a normal when you when you look at a at a gorilla. Um, its mouth is slightly wider than what the nose and eyes are, but this was much more pronounced. It, it, I, I'd say it was like, if you, if you were to put your finger right where the mandible and the upper skull connect in your jaw, that's where the mouth started. That's why the teeth were just so pronounced because its mouth was wide open. And then the last thing we saw was them basically getting prepped to be hauled away. Uh, we they were about to turn the mail, but we didn't see that because we were quickly moved. Yeah, what a night of uh, shock and horror. I mean, I could see now why the captain was, he slapped you to get your attention. I mean, you're you're probably completely in shock with what you're seeing. 
I believe so. Yeah. I mean, I, at that point I was already feeling the effects of what me and the other two guys were feeling. Um, I, I guess it, it was infrasound and when he's trying to talk to us, I'm trying hard not to get, not to throw up in front of him as well. I'm trying to keep it together. Yeah, I'm really curious about you guys being sick afterwards. Um, and, you know, infrasound is something that usually is projected at you. You guys were roared at, and I might have missed it in the beginning, but how far away was that roar? I know it's dark and it's kind of hard to tell at times, but would you say like half a mile? No. It, it, like I said earlier, we were about 300 meters or less. I had actually had a map once uh, of that area that we were at, and so I got the protractor and base looking at the, where we were at at that hill and where we went down, it was approximately about 300 meters. So relatively close. I mean, you're talking less than a thousand feet. About, yeah, exactly. We were less than that. Um, the roar, I mean, to me, this roar sounded like it was less than a hundred feet. I've I've heard a lion roar. I've heard uh, the the tigers when when they're breathing, you know, with that they have that tint of a growl. Um, and some people have said they've gotten sick by that. Um, it, this roar just echoed so loudly, and like I said, it, it, you can literally feel it. I've never felt anything like that before. Um, there was um, the closest thing I come to that one time we were in a lake and I'm not scuba. I mean, I got the flippers and the goggles. Um, I'm just careening the, the surface and there was a boat that roared by about 20 feet from me. Um, and you can literally feel it and hear it as it went through but it still didn't even come close to what this this creature did yeah i was gonna ask you you know if it was the reason why you guys got sick maybe you were too close to the creatures but i guess the captain wasn't sick uh or if it was fear and shock but you're thinking it's more of possibly infrasound that you were hit with when it roared i'm thinking it because the other two also got sick the other two that were inside the Humvee, they were sleeping on the bed of the Humvee. So I don't think they got the, I don't know what you call it, the vibration of that sound. And it was the three of us that were outside that got it and that felt sick and threw up. All three of us threw up. Yeah, I wanted to ask your opinion about something, specifically about that night. You know, I've, I've heard many, many reports, was, even outside of Fort Lewis, I've heard many, many reports of soldiers running into these creatures on these military bases. And um, I'm curious, what do you think happened that night? Do you think that in the past, these specific creatures were aggressive with soldiers, so they had to do something about it? Or do you think that... Uh, they go through every once in a while and clean house or, as it was put to me, quietly securing the base. That's exactly what I was thinking about. Um, Fort Lewis is so huge. You know, a lot of it is just, any, you know, civilians can end up walking in it and they don't even know. Um, I don't know if these Sasquatches were attacking. I don't know if they were doing things towards soldiers or even the civilian homes, the farmlands that are out there, I don't know if they were doing something and they went ahead and tracked them and and neutralized the situation. Um, it was obvious to me that because they were there and these soldiers were there, they were on the hunt. They were They had to have been coming for them. Yeah, and I feel for the soldiers out there. I mean, you guys are, you guys have blanks, you're running around doing war games and you know, God forbid one of these things show up. And I often wonder if they, if there's incident reports of people, people being hurt, soldiers being hurt. And so this happens, or if every once in a while they go through and quietly secure the base. 
Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what, I, really, I don't, everything I can think of is, is, is speculating the reason why. Um, any question that we asked, we were told to shut up. Don't ask. Yeah. Um, we, again, you know, that threat that they made really put the fear in us that we didn't want to talk about this. I mean, this is 26 years now. And <clears throat> just reliving this again with you, I mean, the hairs on my arm were standing up. Um, and when I sent you this notification, this this letter, e the, the email, Wes, I, I was so hesitant to press send. I really it was like, oh, God, what if they come after me? What if they do this? And, and they follow through. Um, the government has released information on UFOs. They, they finally said, Hey, they're real. I know they know about these things. I know they know about these creatures because if they didn't, they wouldn't be trying to tell you to shut up and not mention anything. I mean, cause I know you've had people, um, on, on your show, there are civilians that were threatened by some government officials or told what they actually saw knowing full well that they saw what they saw. Um, you know, I don't know why the government doesn't, doesn't let it, doesn't let people know that, Hey, this is real. Some say it'll affect the, the, the wood industry. You know, I don't think it will. I don't think it will at all because this has been going on for centuries. Nothing has stopped, you know, people going out from chopping down trees and building houses and, these creatures have been surviving well without our help. Yeah, I agree with almost everything you just said. Um, I want to ask you, I mean, did you and the guys ever talk about this again? When I went to Germany, um, I actually saw one of the guys that was in my, in my off four team. Saw him at the commissary there at Würzburg and, he and I just gave each other that look. And so we stepped outside and I asked him, do you ever think about that night? And he says, all the time, all the time. And um, he actually admitted that he told a few people. And I was like, oh, God, you know, keep my name out of it. Yeah, how could you guys forget a night like that? I mean, what a horrific night, and I think it would really, really haunt me. I understand you guys keeping your mouth closed, so, you know, you don't want to lose your career. You were in the military for over 20 years, and, you know, you just don't want to give that up over Sasquatch. I get it. Um, can I ask you, when you were looking at the female as she was dying, um, was there anything human about her or human-like? I mean, other than, you know, having the normal, you know, I mean, her, her legs, according to her, you know, looking at her, at her body, her legs seemed smaller than what they would for her body. Her arms were definitely long, longer. I mean, if her, her arms were basically spread out as if she was on a cross, um, Everything about her was, except for having legs and human-like toes and, and, and arms, that was the only thing that I would, I would say was human-like. Her face did not look, she did have a nose. It was definitely larger, a little bit wider. It was about inch and a half, two inches, like, well, inch and a half from the bottom of her nose to the top of her upper part of her mouth she didn't have lips um she just had a mouth well well I, I would say her mouth looked similar to what you see with a chimp or with a gorilla it's not you know there there are no lip features like you have in human yeah i understand what you're saying i i think it's fascinating you were able to get that close you know i'm sure it's more of a nightmare for you uh, before I ask you what you think Sasquatch is, how did this affect you? How did this kind of affect your life or did it? I, I don't want to be one of these uh, conspiracy theorists and, and the like, but yeah, it kind of made me 
question some of the things that the government does, but it still doesn't stop my love for this country, my love for the people in this country, the joy I had in the military. I wasn't going to let it stop me from being, you know, a, a good man, a good dad, um, and a good soldier. But when I would have those times alone by myself, it, yeah, it put, you know, it starts that little fear factor, you know, starts creeping in. Yeah, I think something must have happened for them to, you know, basically go out and kill two of these things. It does make you question a lot of things when you see things that supposedly don't exist. Um, I ask everyone on the show, Rick, and there's no wrong answer because no one knows. But what do you think Sasquatch is? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I thought a lot about this because I I'd hear your guests or talk about it being supernatural. And I'd always, you know, start just yelling <laughs> at the podcast saying, no, that's a bunch of baloney. Um, and, you know, hearing this thing about the Nephilim. One of the things I started studying in regards to this was the Native Americans. The Native Americans had no reason to lie to the frontiersmen and the people expanding west when they were telling them stories about Sasquatch. They had no reason. They would tell them about the big man of the woods. They would tell them about Skookum, Sasquatch, and Oma, and all these other names that they had for it. They had no reason to lie. And some of the things that they mentioned were of a supernatural. So I started to think, and this is just my own hypothesis coming from a Christian man who believes in the Bible, looking at Genesis chapter six, looking at the book of Numbers that mentioned the Nephilim. You know, if this did happen and the Bible said it did, so I have to believe it. If these fallen angels did, you know, have sexual encounters with women, and at that time, the Bible says God was angry at man because he's become so perverted. I'm sure there was forms of bestiality taking place. Um, and I'm sure some of these fallen angels saw man having his fun with an animal here and there. Who's to say they could have gone to an ape and done this? I don't know. I mean, th that possibility is there. Is it true? I don't know. Everything I see about Gigantic, Gigantopithecus, every drawing, every sketch, every everything that they put out on it, 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 it looks like an oversized orangutan. So I don't think it's Gigantopithecus. And again, if this is an offspring of these fallen angels, then that DNA of supernatural activities such as disappearing out of thin air maybe it's true i'm not saying it is i can't prove it is but if they have this dna from fallen angels that could come at will move at will appear disappear uh, why wouldn't it pass on to them so i mean it's far-fetched but it was there that the the men these these delta guys were holding it lifting it up moving it getting it ready so it was there there was blood a few days after this situation what happened we actually drove back to that hill and i don't know who did it but there was like a 60 foot radius everything was moved was removed no rocks, no grass, no weeds. Uh, the the ground was tilled. There was no sign of blood anywhere. Yeah, I've definitely heard that many times before. I think I was even witness to it one time. Um, and it makes sense. They don't want to leave the evidence behind. Like you said, there is people. There are portions of Fort Lewis uh, where you're not really sure as you're coming in, if you're actually on the base or not. Uh, there are, or There used to be areas like that anyway. Uh, but it's an amazing account, man. I really appreciate you coming forward and sharing it. I think it takes a lot of courage to come on and and share this. And I know you've been holding holding on to it for such a long time. And Rick, thanks so much for being a member, man. I know when I first started, you you were one of the first members to come on, and 
Uh, now I, I have you on the show. I really appreciate being here, and I appreciate your support, man. Thank you, Wes. Uh, can I give a shout out to somebody or some a few people here? Yeah, of course you can. Um, you know, I just want to say thank you to all the service members currently serving. If you're listening, uh, thank you very much for what you do. I know these times are pretty hard times, and for all the veterans out there. Thank you for your service and just a shout out to my kids, Jaden and Jasmine. You know, they're my heart and my soul. And um, without them, you know, really, I wouldn't be here right now, to be honest. And uh, I, I I owe them everything. Very cool shout out. Thanks again, Rick. You're welcome, Wes. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows.